Good afternoon and welcome to this Wilson Center Africa program event and webcast on herder farmer conflicts and food security in Southeast Nigeria, plugging the gaps in the peace building policy framework. I am Sherry Ayers and I am the communications program assistant with the Wilson Center's Africa program. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was chartered by Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. The University of Pennsylvania's global go-to think tank index report recently ranked the Wilson Center as one of the top 10 think tanks globally. The Wilson Center Africa program works to address the most critical issues facing Africa and U.S.-Africa relations, build mutually beneficial U.S.-Africa relations, and enhance knowledge and understanding about Africa in the United States. Today's event is held under the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building, or SVNP. Established with the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the SBNP is a continent-wide network of 22 African policy, research, and academic organizations that work with the Wilson Center's Africa program to bring African knowledge and perspectives to U.S., African, and international policy on peace building in Africa. One of the main components of the network is a research scholarship program. Scholars from member organizations are hosted by Africa program here in Washington, D.C. for a three-month resident scholar program. The selected individuals complete a policy-oriented research project and engage with U.S. policymakers and practitioners. The scholars share their research findings while simultaneously bringing local context and knowledge into U.S. policy discussions. Today, SVMP scholar Dr. Hygienis Banco Okebe will share the results of his research project with us. For those of you who are following us online, <coughs> we're live tweeting today's event and taking questions on Twitter and via our website. To join the discussion, please tweet your questions and tag at Africa Up Close with the hashtags Food Security or SVMP or use the chat function below the current live stream on our website. Please see the Africa Program website for more details. I would now like to introduce Mr. Han Ms. Hannah Aquibo, the Senior Program Associate for the Wilson Center's Africa Program, who will set the stage for today's discussion and today's speakers. Thank you, Sherry. Um, and thank you all for joining us here in person at the Wilson Center, as well as watching online. And thank you to our, our guests for joining us today. Um, as, as Sherry said, my name is Hannah Aquibo, and I'm Senior Program Associate with Africa Program. Um, I'm delighted to um, be moderating today's event. And before I introduce our speakers, I would like to take uh, a few moments just to set the stage for the discussion, uh, which will focus on herder farmer conflicts and food security in Southeast Nigeria. So today's discussion aims to look at two issues, which are on their own of significant policy importance and have received attention as such. Um, but we really hope to look at these two issues together uh, to understand their interplay as well as the linkages between farmer herder conflicts and food insecurity so that we can have a discussion on policy options and recommendations to address this issue. Food security is increasingly of global concern, in part due to Russia's war in Ukraine, as well as due to COVID-19, as well as climate and other environmental factors and conflict-related shocks to food systems. These have led to higher food, fuel, and fertilizer prices as well as lo lower agricultural and livestock inputs. In Nigeria, for example, the country we're speaking of today, the food insecurity has nearly doubled between 2016 and 2020. Meanwhile, farmer herder tensions in Nigeria and the region, while traditionally manageable, have been, the tensions have been on the rise, with thousands of death, deaths reported in the last decade as well as additional disruptions to local economies and, local, and, and livelihoods. These conflicts have also disrupted livestock and crop production in Nigeria. 
So as we hear from today's speakers, they're going to situate the conflict in Nigeria's broader geopolitical context, as well as assess the state of food security and conflict, and provide their recommendations as well as lessons learned of what has worked or what could be improved upon. And I'm really looking forward to those analysis and recommendations. So with that, I will introduce our guests. Their full bios are online as well as in the event handout um, that's available. And uh, so I'll just give the, a brief introduction. Our first speaker is Dr. Mark Dirksen. Dr. Dirksen is a research associate at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. His research focuses on Africa's unparalleled urbanization and the security challenges and opportunities that this presents. Dr. Dirksen closely follows Nigeria and brings deep knowledge of the underlying land, governance, social, and developmental dynamics driving current tensions and conflicts in and around the continent cities. And we're also privileged to be joined by our SVMP scholar, Dr. Hygienist Bunko Okibe. Dr. Okibe holds a PhD in political science. He is a senior lecturer at Enugu State University of Science and Technology, the Department of Political Science, and at the Institute for Peace, Conflict, and Development Studies at the university. He has research interests in social studies, social science subjects, including governance and development. And currently, he is the director of work ethics at, at the university, the coordinator of a postgraduate program in the Department of Political Science, and he's the secretary of the Nigerian Political Science Association Southeast Zone. So before turning it over to our speakers for their remarks, I uh, will just mention briefly, um, uh, reiterate what Sherry said, that if you're following on Twitter, you can tweet us at Africa Up Close um, using the hashtag food security or hashtag SVMP. So with that, Dr. Dirksen, over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Equibo, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, what, what I'll do is provide a brief overview of um, what's become an increasingly complex issue of farmer herder violence in Nigeria and West Africa more broadly. So I'll look at some of the recent trends, some of the key drivers, um, and some of the policy responses that can help mitigate this violence and help prevent it from becoming a larger driver of food insecurity in Nigeria and West Africa. So as most people probably know in this room and online, um, Nigeria faces a number of serious internal security challenges from Boko Haram in the Northeast to piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, and here highlighted in green, you can see um, har farmer herder related violence and its geographic distribution across the country. So it affects a number of states um, in several different regions of the country, um, but it's primarily concentrated in the Northwest um, the states of Zamfara, Katsina, Kaduna, and in the Middle Belt states um, above the southeast. There's also pockets in the southeast and southwest, um, which we're going to focus on today. Um, so here's another um, slide, just a little bit easier to see that distribution of farmer herder violence in Nigeria. And this problem is not isolated to Nigeria, but it's really a proliferating issue across um, West Africa more broadly. Here you can see, um, going back to 2010, how um, clashes related to farmer herder violence um, have spread throughout West Africa. Um, so you can see between 2010 and 2013, um, there were just a few events, mostly concentrated in that Middle Belt region of Nigeria and a little bit in the northeast or the northwest. Um, you can see it start to expand 2014 to 2017, um, and then more recently, this is 2018 to 2021, um, really this proliferation of, of conflict. Um, and it affects not just Nigeria, um, but Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, um, and as you can see, it's, it's moved farther southward in Nigeria. So in, this, in the southeast of Nigeria, though, the um, recent trend hasn't been so dramatic. So looking at 2018 to 2022, um, events have kind of varied um, between 17 events, violent events between farmers and herders to 25, and kind of it's gone up and down throughout that time. Um, but the longer trend is clear. So what is causing this dramatic shift over this previous decade? Um, and here, 
um, I think these two maps help us understand um, just as a starting point what's happening at a regional level um, and some of the dynamics at play. Um, so really over the last 10 years and going back farther, um, 50, 60 years, the population in West Africa has increased dramatically. Um, and this population growth has um, meant that acres of cropland, heads of cattle um, have also increased to meet this growing demand for food. Um, so for example, in Nigeria, between 2010 and 2022, the country added over, over 65 million people um, and the number of cattle in the country increased from around 16 million to over, now over 22 million. Um, similarly, cropland, as you can see here highlighted in purple, um, it increased significantly over this time span as well. Um, so what, what we have here is farmers and herders essentially competing for the same scarce resources. They're competing for um, fertile land and water. And agricultural expansion has um, eaten into livestock pasture and hi historical transhumanist roots at the same time that larger herds um, and greater numbers of herds are eating and trampling crops. So this is really primarily a, a resource conflict um, in the lens through which it's most productive and helpful to see and address it. Um, of course, there are a number of other um, issues in addition to population increase and land use pattern changes. Um, one of those is climate change. Um, as you can see from this study, um, the number of consecutive dry days in Nigeria has been increasing, while the number of consecutive wet days um, throughout much of the country has been decreasing. So that basically means um, that pasture is drying out and herders are um, moving farther south looking for, um, looking for greener pastures, basically. Um, this is a, a map of traditional um, migration routes that um, herders in West Africa would move back and forth along these axes. Um, and so what is happening now is that these routes are being pushed south um, as, as herders look for um, water and pasture that isn't um, dried out. Um, and then they're staying south longer um, as they're avoiding the desiccation happening farther north. So there are also a number of other complicating factors that need to be considered to understand um, the local dynamics of farmer herder violence. Um, two that are particularly relevant to Southeast Nigeria and to the South-South region of Nigeria, um, and two, two issues that make it particularly combustible um, are the presence of armed criminal gangs um, and militant separatists in the region. Um, as you can see on this map, um, the um, separatist groups are highlighted in purple and the um, organized criminal gangs in blue and their activities um, are highlighted there. Um, and so as, um, as many people in who follow Nigeria are aware, um, criminal activity has really become a growth industry in the country. Kidnapping for ransom, um, robbery, um, or something that Nigerians are acutely aware um, is spreading um, in the country. And as people look to kind of these organizations as a way to um, make a livelihood, to make profit um, in a country where there's over 30% unemployment. So that's a separate issue, except for that it affects farmer herder conflict um, because oftentimes the targets of these criminal organizations are, are herders' cattle. Um, they're particularly vulnerable to um, uh, kidnapping cattle ransom because they're exposed. Um, they're you know um, walking through pastures. They're in the the open fields, um, and oftentimes cattle is the most valuable resource in rural communities. So it's the target of these um, these robberies. Um, and as a result, um, many herders have begun to arm themselves to purchase firearms from the same criminal gangs that then um, you know, provides them a, a stream of income. And they've also organized into um, ethnic or communal militias to try and defend their, their livestock. Um, so this development makes farmer herder clashes more deadly um, and is contributing to this growing climate of suspicion and mistrust. Um, 
So then on top of that, um, there's also militant separatist groups active in the southeast part of Nigeria. Um, so these are groups that are um, agitating for independence for a rebirth of um, the Biafra movement that was the source of the Nigerian Civil War in the late 1960s. Um, but recently, some of these militant groups have um, focused their rhetoric in recruiting um, on um, grieva perceived grievances against Fulani herders in the southeast um, and really have used that um, that topic to um, build followers, to um, find recruits, and then to equip them and mobilize them um, against um, you know, uh, enforcing these open banning graze, uh, open um, grazing bans in the southeast. Um, so this is really a um, particularly dangerous in development um, in Nigeria, where southern politicians, media. Um, have often framed farmer herder conflict along um, ethnic, religious, and regional lines um, and have demonized uh, Fulani herders. So there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories around these clashes. Um, and it really makes it all the more combustible when um, we're talking about is issues, really um, emotionally potent issues of land, livelihood, and culture. Um, and so, as we've seen elsewhere, farmer herder conflict can easily be um, inflamed and spread through this kind of hate speech and incitement um, against, um, you know, sharpening the issue along ethnic, ethnic or religious lines. So what can be done about um, these problems? Um, in the short term, I think the focus needs to be on de-escalation, um, and here the um, the uh, incitement, the demonizing rhetoric really needs to be tamped down. Um, it needs to be monitored and removed from social media platforms where a lot of these separatist groups are active in recruiting. Um, and it should be prosecuted under Nigerian law um, when it's in the press or by politicians. Um, at the local level, um, community leaders should be trained um, in dispute resolution techniques um, and supported an effort to build bridges between farmers and herders. Um, and this is an area where um, the U.S. can help build capacity and help um, contribute expertise. Um, so in areas where there is this really sustained concentration of farmer herder violence, um, like we saw on the heat map, some of those pockets in the southeast, um, once the, the conflict reaches a certain point, it's, it's really imperative that there's a sustained federal um, and state security response, um, and that this response, the response needs to be um, trusted um, and needs to be, um, you know, when people, when some, when an incident is occurring, um, communities need to know that they can count on um, the police showing up, uh, on security forces showing up and stepping in to um, deter and defuse the violence. And when that happens, that opens up a space for dialogue um, and these um, bi bridge building efforts um, to, to, to grow and have space. Um, of course, this is complicated in the, the Southeast um, where the separatist movements, oftentimes the, the target of their, um, their activities is security forces. Um, so there have been a number of attacks against um, police checkpoints, police stations in the Southeast. So that needs to be sustaining a security presence is part of um, a broader effort to build, um, rebuild trust with um, communities in the Southeast. And then finally, um, in the longer term, th the big question is um, that needs to be addressed is Nigeria's um, investment in strategic thinking on land management policies and practice. Um, the friction between farmers and herders isn't going to go away. It's only going to scale up as Nigeria's population, um, you know, by some estimates, is projected to double um, by 2050. Um, so these, these um, pressures are only going to intensify. A number of governors in southern Nigeria, um, if not all of them, have banned open grazing in recent years. And so this, this seems to be the direction that Nigeria is headed. Um, bans on open grazing and policies of um, constructing and um, designating land for large-scale ranches. Um, so that is a policy 
um, you know, that's been put in place under um, the current um, administration in Nigeria. Um, but the rollout has been uneven. It's um, lacked funding. It's lacked leadership. Um, and more resources need to be dedicated to seeing this policy through and implementing it in a way where it's a process where um, once open grazing bans are introduced, that that doesn't just mean that herders all of a sudden don't have anywhere to take their, their herds or their livestock. Um, you know, those herds aren't going away. The demand for beef isn't going away. Um, they need access to the ranches um, and to have an alternative in the meantime as these policies are implemented. Um, so I'll conclude by just pointing out that currently um, a lot of Nigeria is um, at a stressed level of food insecurity, um, including parts of the southeast. Um, a lot of what is driving this is um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, rising grain prices. Nigeria receives a lot of its grain, a significant portion from Ukraine. Um, so this has really um, been a, a short, caused a shortage in a lot of Nigeria and caused inflation of food prices. Um, hopefully this, as is projected in this map on the right, um, will ease some in the coming months um, into 2023. Um, but you can see where the, really the crisis and emergency levels of food insecurity are. Those are the areas where there's um, really a concentration and of conflict, um, whether it's banditry um, in the Northwest or um, the militant Islamist groups in the Northeast. Um, and th those conflicts have reached a level now where um, really those regions are largely cut off from the rest of Nigeria. The highways are incredibly dangerous to travel on. Um, Farmers have abandoned their fields. Um, herders are not taking their livestock there. Um, and that's when these kind of really crisis level food insecurity um, can develop. And so I think it's, it's important that we're having this conversation today um, at this point when the Southeast isn't affected by this level of food insecurity um, because farmer herder conflict can be sharpened into this kind of um, intensive conflict if it is continues to be pushed along um, ethnic or religious or regional lines. Um, and so I think that this is, this is a critical stage to address the issue um, and start talking about interventions and responses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dirksen, um, for, for your remarks. Dr. Okibe, turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will be speaking specifically on uh, Southeast, having laid the background. Um, the Southeast part of Nigeria is one of the six geopolitical zones we have in the country. And it comprises of five states. These five states has a population of uh, 16 million something out of the 140 something million which Nigeria recorded in 2006 census count. The five states is occupying a land area of uh, 29,388 square kilometer out of 911,000 square kilometer, which is the total land area in Nigeria. Nigeria has a total of uh, 84 million arable lands out of which about 40% uh, or thereabout is cultivated. Of this, we have 6.5%, uh, which is uh, for crop farming, and 28.6%, uh, which is for pasture and uh, mildew. The crisis between farmers and herders in Nigeria, which of course has extended to Southeast, didn't start today. It has been a thing of uh, several decades ago. But we are going to find out at what point did it become too controversial and, uh, of course, violent. In the traditional community of African states, most African communities, and, of course, uh, which uh, Southeast is part of, herders and farmers had coexisted peacefully. The headers we are conducting their business, and the farmers as well, we are just doing their farming. 
they lived on the basis of dialogue and the negotiation of whatever could result in conflict between them. They have made peace. They laid out measures of arriving at consensus on whatever would be a threat to their coexistence. They have used compensation to, of course, uh, appease each party when there is offense committed. And this has kept them going for a very long time. Suddenly, after the civil war that was fought in Nigeria between 1967 and 1970, of course, the Southeast played a key role in the war. Southeast fought the entire Nigeria in that war under the umbrella of Biafra. And after the defeat of Southeast, which of course was reduced to no victor, no vanquished, the dramatic uh, episode of uh, relationship between Southeast and the North changed dramatically. The suspicion became so high that uh, any infiltration of North, Northern uh, Muslims into Southeast is suspected as an agenda for colonization or invasion. But in the recent decade, the relationship between farmers and herders changed across all sectors of the uh, economy of Nigeria. This was as a result of uh, the desert encroachment, which of course intensified the issue of uh, desertification, the issue of uh, uh, loss of uh, green grasses in the north. All this combined to produce an environment that was no longer conducive for the headers to rear their cattle. So they had the opportunity of uh, having an alternative, which is the south side of Nigeria. And in the course of their movement to south, their cattle occasionally trample and they damage crops. And the way such happens, what is usually done is just to request for compensation. Because of escalation of conflict across all parts of Nigeria in the past 10 years, the headers' attitude changed. They became aggressive because some of them are not original headers that Southeast people used to know. Many of them became militants that have just uh, found themselves amongst these headers. They execute the terrorist agenda that they have, causing mayhem and destruction in every part of Nigeria. We recall that in the south, south-south, the headers conflict is pronounced there. In the southwest, it is also pronounced, but more pronounced in the north central, which is regarded as middle belt zone. Because there, that is where you have the capital of our crop production in Nigeria. In fact, it is regarded as the food basket of the country, the north central. Now, because of the activities in North Central, every other, every other section in Nigeria became apprehensive of their coming. During the time of election of 2015, which President Muhammad Buhari contested, and of course being a Fulani man, the Fulanese found his victory as a fertile ground to operate freely in Nigeria. Many of them that had stayed in other parts of the countries in West Africa and Central African Republic started migrating in drove to Nigeria. There was no serious border check to know who is coming in and who is a legitimate in immigrant to Nigeria. The border was so collapsed to a point that they gained free access and the field everywhere. So these militants who have become part of Boko Haram, some of them part of uh, bandits 
that are into all act of uh, violence now had a cause to transfer their violence to southern Nigeria. And uh, every part of southern Nigeria started agitating, of course, challenging the federal government that they should do something to tame the excesses of the headers. Nothing tangible was done. In fact, in the southeast, the attack became so strategic that people started interpreting, interpreting it as something that is uh, uh, premeditated. All the agricultural zones in the southeast became a target. All the places where there are farm settlements became a target. We have all of them spread across the five states, other than which is a very fertile ground for production of crops, and which of course produces what has been feeding Enugu State and the surrounding communities was paralyzed. There was no agricultural activities there again because uh, the attack became intensive. Many lives were lost, crops destroyed, and nobody had the courage to return to farm again, thereby abandoning farm. If you go to Abakiriki, it was the same in many of the strategic areas. Is it used to produce yam in great quantity? And because of this conflict, the yam production ceased to, of course, uh, operate. If you go to Ibariam in Anambra State, Ibariam is an agricultural zone. Ibariam and uh, Omobanam, these are places where crops are produced in abundance in Anambra State. And these places are targeted. And because of the nature of the attack, which of course uh, centered around these agricultural zones, Southeast people started looking at it as a mission to cause food scarcity in the zone, and of course replicate the experience they had during the war, when there was food blockade that of course resulted in many of them dying out of, as a result of Pashoko, that is malnutrition. Now, government has done uh, a little to address this issue. I will just uh, highlight those uh, <coughs> attempts that have been made. Federal government has uh, intervened in different ways, most important being sending uh, security agencies to quell the crisis when it has arisen. And of course, when they do go, their own is to maintain peace at the moment. When they see that peace has returned, they will just all disperse. And that has not been sustainable because it creates room for another round of attack. Government has also made an appeal through the uh, Nigerian um, uh, Council of States, that is the highest policy-making organ of the state. These are people who have led the, the state in the past, the country, and they were all called together to look into this crisis. They constituted the committee, and the committee recommended that open grazing of cattle should be banned. It is surprising that government did not implement it up to this moment we are talking. But this is the highest policy-making body recommending such a thing, having seen the enormity of challenge that the open grazing is posing to the Nigerian masses. Now, the presidency along the line just uh, came up with a template which requested that governors should create a grazing route in their states so that the Fulanese can have easy access without uh, much trouble. That, of course, uh, all the governors declined to provide. And that was part of the reason federal government opposed the ban on open grazing, which the, all 17 Southern governors agreed on, including the governor of Benue State, which is at uh, North Central Zone. And if you recall, the essence of that ban which the 
Southern governors did was to reflect the resolution of the National Executive Council of Nigeria, which had proposed that there was need for such a open grazing to be banned. It is surprising that at the heat of this conflict, when it was expected that every government should be at par in addressing the issue, there seems to be misunderstanding amongst the tiers of government we have in Nigeria. Now, the recommendation I have is that uh, as it is now, there is need for African Union to come together to agree on how to address this issue because it has become a continental problem. It's not peculiar to Nigeria, it's a general problem. Two is that federal government should now work in synergy with the National Assembly to enact a law that will ban open grazing across every state of Nigeria. Then there is need for federal government, the state government, local government, and community leaders to collaborate and see how they can de-escalate this tension and, of course, mop illegal arms, which all these non-state actors have in their custody and with which they cause most of the confusion. I also recommend that there should be a concerted effort for the cow owners, the cattle owners, and the pastoralists to think of how they can grow grass in the north. It is very strategic. There is no environment that cannot be changed if there is such commitment. I also recommend that uh, as the ranches are being proposed, and of course the government has made the initial uh, uh, budgetary allocation of 6.25 billion. While it is being uh, expected that uh, it will be extended to other areas, all the cattle in the southeast should, southeast and south as a whole should be registered. When there is registration, it will capture the identity of the cow owner and of course, a pin number will be issued to each header so that there will be a tie of that P number to the license number of the cow owner. In the event that there is any misconduct that will jeopardize peaceful coexistence, that uh, identifier particulars can be used to locate whoever that is involved. So if we do this, I think uh, we shall have a good uh, outcome from the implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okibe, for your remarks. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to audience Q&A, um, just to remind folks who are watching online that you can submit your questions through Twitter, uh, use uh, Africa Up Close, using the hashtags food security and SVNP. Or if you're watching um, WilsonCenter.org, there is a, an event chat box function. So please go ahead and utilize that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our audience um, in the auditorium first. Um, so while, while folks are thinking of questions, I'll just ask you um, to identify yourself as well as your organization. Um, and if you are directing your, uh, your question to any particular speaker, um, please go ahead and, note and, and um, indicate that as well. Uh, while we're grabbing a, 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 a microphone for the q and I'm just going to reflect a little bit on some of your, your key points. Um, so, Dr. Dirksen, you talked about some of the key drivers of the conflict, um, primarily being the population increase and pressures that that is putting on food systems and resource competition being one of the main main ways that this is manifesting. Um, you talked about some of the complicating factors, uh, both changing patterns of land use as well as climate and the climate effects and their impacts on land use in Nigeria. Other complicating factors that you mentioned were uh, the increase in gangs and militant separatists and particularly um, the some of the, the violence being driven um, by economic, economic drivers with un unemployment in Nigeria and seeing it as a, um, some, some means of livelihood. Um, 
And you also mentioned that some of the, the key responses um, need to be in de-escalation. You mentioned security responses, which is something also, Dr. Okibe, you mentioned, um, but particularly that they need to be trusted and also that they're there to deter violence. Uh, so I think those were two really important elements of that security response recommendation, um, as well as looking at land management policies. Um, and Dr. Okibe, I think some of the, the, the key points that really came out um, from, from your framing was um, setting the stage that these have been historically peaceful and manageable relationships in Nigeria, but also in the region, and that there have been traditional mechanisms and community level mechanisms for engaging in dialogue and negotiation for conflict resolution, uh, but those have become weakened over the last decade. And you also highlighted some of the, the legacy, for, particularly for the Southeast region, some of the legacies of the Civil War that is another complicating factor um, fueling mistrust between communities in Nigeria. Uh, you also highlighted climate impacts and desertification, which is um, reducing, loss, the reducing area for grazing areas. Um, and then you talked about some of your key um, recommendations, which I would like to get into a bit in the Q&A, but um, I think we have a microphone now. So I want to turn it over also to our audience. So please raise your hand. I will call on you um, first. Get at you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to appreciate the speakers uh, for presenting really informative uh, ideas and uh, issues. Uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm Getacho from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm also a former SVNP Africa program uh, scholar. Uh, my first question goes to uh, Dr. Mark. Um, you have recommended three important uh, issues, especially to handle the problem in uh, Nigeria and West Afri Africa. Have you come across uh, the some attempts by government or uh, regional organizations in addressing these problems or in utilizing the recommendation that you have stated before. And the second question goes to uh, Dr. Okebe. Um, uh, have you come across with the traditional conflict resolution mechanism, which are really very important in Nigeria, uh, that the people having diversified uh, cultures in addressing the herd and uh, uh, farmers' uh, problem uh, because I believe these traditional conflict resolution mechanisms are really indispensable in addressing in such kinds of communities and conflicts. I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'll take one more if there's another question from the audience. Dr. Florence. Oh, pardon me. Yes, this lady. Um, hello, uh, my name is Amanda Feldman. I'm from Search for Common Ground. Um, so the Biden administration has recently released their Africa strategy plan. And so I'm wondering if either of you could speak to the ways in which you think that the United States government um, can engage with this issue, um, especially given the, the Biden administration's focus on climate change um, and climate resilience. Thank you. And Dr. Florence. Uh, thank you to the speakers for the insightful presentations. My name is uh, Florence Odur from Kenya. I'm a uh, SVNP a maid scholar. My question is to Dr. Okibe. Uh, you have mentioned that um, desertification and loss of grass are the main drivers of the the farmer uh, harder conflicts, and. Uh, in the, in the earlier presentation, we have seen that uh, population growth as well as increase in the number of livestock is uh, uh, exacerbating the situation. Uh, in the southeast that you have looked at, is this also an, a, a, a problem that could be bringing about the conflict? I didn't hear you mention that. And then another question still to you is that um, you informed us that uh, when President Buhari was um, inaugurated and being a Fulani, so Fulanis found their way into Nigeria and into Southeast Nigeria. And uh, because of their coming in, they got into militant groups as well as Boko Haram. 
And um, my question is, could this be uh, a factor that is uh, uh, exacerbating conflict and not necessarily um, farmer harder? Because when militants and, and, and uh, come in, then the situation then probably is different. The driver of the conflict may just be different. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got actually those five questions, um, a, good, a good set of questions, so thank you. Uh, I'll just reiterate them um, and then turn it, turn it over to you all to answer. So Gatachu is um, asking specifically about what um, national or regional government, I think particularly you're highlighting regional government attempts, um, have been made to address this that could perhaps offer some lessons learned or some examples that you could highlight. Um, and he also asked about traditional conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, what those look like in Southeast Nigeria. And, and I, perhaps I might add on to that. Um, you mentioned that they have been working in the past. Is, if you have some analysis on um, why they may not be working or what could be done to um, support those conflict rec resolution mechanisms. Um, and then in light of President Biden's Africa strategy, what, um, and I'll, I'll address this to both of you, but what, um, what value added or how could the U.S. engage, um, particularly with uh, administration's focus on, on climate and climate change? What role could the U.S. play in, in on supporting these issues? And then from Florence, she also um, had a climate-related question to hear a bit more about um, the de desertification as a driver of the conflict. And then her final question touched on a point you made, Dr. Okibe, um, on I think what I heard you talking about was um, border governance and porous borders and how that is a, uh, a security challenge which is layering on. Um, and so if you wanted to address that as well. Um, so I think I'll just start and bring it in. So Dr. Dirksen, if you want to answer, um, and then I'll turn to you, Dr. Okibe. Sure. Um, thanks for the questions. Um, really, really sharp questions. And um, the, the question on national and regional responses, I think, um, is, is where we need to start. We know what has been done, what is working, what isn't. Um, so Nigeria has a national livestock transformation plan, um, which I, I briefly mentioned. This was um, put in place in 2019. Um, it was a really big um, and really visionary initiative, I think, um, that on paper has a lot of promise. It had um, buy-in from governors in the Middle Belt in the North. Um, and then it also, you know, proposes gradually adopting um, a complete ban on open grazing. So that's something that southern governors um, clearly are advocating for. Um, so there's there's a lot of potential in this plan. And the, the idea is that it started out with these pilot programs of establishing um, small, medium, and large-scale ranches in a, in a few states um, and transitioning from open grazing to ranching in those states. Um, and then the idea is to scale up to, I think, um, something like 117 ranches over time, um, which is, um, it's an ambitious plan. Um, obviously, there are, there are some gaps in it, um, and currently um, there's a, a funding issue. There's um, just, a, you know, an expertise issue and enough people to administer it. Um, and keep it going. It requires a lot of um, coordination and um, collaboration with state governments um, in Nigeria and for them to implement the plan. Um, and then there's, there's also some gaps in it. Um, it doesn't address um, the issue of cross-border migration um, and the fact that a lot of herders are coming from Niger, coming from Burkina Faso and crossing into Nigeria. Um, and so it's, it's the northern states that are also feeling this pressure, too, and are having these, these conflicts. Um, and it's, it's often, um, it's, it's not just, um, you know, Fulani um, who are, are the herders are often also um, the victims of this violence. They're the victims of um, armed bandits, of these militant groups. Um, so I think we have to be really careful there to um, not conflate kind of all herders with, with those groups, but recognize that especially in the North, they're oftentimes, um, you know, dealing with these same problems um, and looking for solutions as well. Um, so I think there is need for, for greater regional coordination. Um, I, 
not aware of any initiatives um, to date. Um, it's not saying that there are, there aren't they aren't there, but that's going to be really I think uh, an important piece of the puzzle um, to address um, you know, the, the fact that historically th this has been um, a a livelihood that is involved crossing borders, that is involved back and forth um, seasonal seeking of of pasture, um, and so to suddenly transition away from that. Um, there has to be some consideration of what happens to those people, what happens to those herds, um, how is that managed, what, what is their place in this future um, model of, of land management in Nigeria. Um, and then the, the question on um, the U.S. Africa strategy, the new, the new um, Africa strategy, and it's, it's um, uh, important focus on climate change in Africa um, as really a strategic issue and an issue um, you know, Africa is, is the continent that um, contributes the least carbon in, in the world, um, but it's feeling some of the most severe effects of climate change um, from the desiccation I was mentioning in Nigeria um, to, you know, just in the news recently, I've been reading um, about um, the flooding in Niger and Sudan um, and in Burkina Faso and Chad. Um, so it's really this erratic, um, patterns of climate that I was highlighting with the, you know, these number of consecutive dry days um, going up and these unpredictable weather patterns. Um, so, so how do we address that really? Um, and how, how can the U.S. support addressing that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging issue because, um, you know, there's a, there's a um, focus on resilience and adaptation. Um, a lot of these communities are kind of um, tapped out when it comes to how much they can adapt. You know, their ad adaptation is to move further south or to look for, for um, pasture somewhere else. And then that's leading to these conflicts. Um, so I think there, one, one of the ways, um, you know, solutions can be sought is there, there is a, a research gap um, trying to understand some of these new weather patterns, having the data, there is, um, gaps in the monitoring in Nigeria, in um, Africa more generally, of weather patterns, of changing climate, of ch uh, changing temperatures. Um, so filling some of those gaps and understanding how the weather patterns are, are changing in West Africa um, and supporting those initiatives, I think, is, is one way to um, contribute, you know, understanding this issue from a climate perspective um, and thinking about how to help farmers and herders adapt um, to those new realities, um, and then that brings in the, you know, the issue of, of land management. Um, and if, you know, part of the adaptation is that a different part of the country is now becoming more of the, um, the space where herders need to go because that's where there is um, arable land where they can graze their cattle, um, then that needs to be addressed and um, worked out. To, to make those kind of um, adaptations on a, on a countrywide level. Uh, thank you. You asked a question about a traditional conflict resolution mechanism. In uh, southeast Nigeria, we, we have a, a traditional way of settling such conflict in the past. I recall that uh, any time the Fulani with the Akato arrives in the community, the Sariki, who is the head of uh, the Fulani community, will report to the traditional ruler of the community to announce their presence and they seek permission for them to live in a particular place. Then he will also um, at least uh, show a sort of commitment to obeying whatever regulation that uh, guides the community and, uh, of course, uh, keeping peace and making sure that uh, the cattle do, uh, uh, do not uh, destroy any, any crop. Uh, that has been the, the pattern that uh, you know, existed all the while. But of late, they will invade the farmland, invade the forest without announcing anything to anybody. And if you go to ask, then you come back with the bruises. So that is why the, that the drama changed. And of course, the major issue is uh, the, the issue of uh, open grazing. Before, it is not that uh, we hadn't open grazing. After all, they were not in any ranch. We have all the while had open grazing. But the new trend is that rather than graze the cattle in the uh, grasses and the rest of them, it is now diverted to farms and crops. 
So that is what is really the foundational uh, you know, level of this uh, crisis. Again, um, somebody asked a question on how can the U.S. government come into this matter. Of course, uh, Mark has addressed that to a reasonable extent. The most important thing is that the uh, U.S. government can be very strategic on the issue of uh, climate change. But if it is to talk about uh, resolving conflict of Heda Farmer, I do not think that the U.S. government should have any stake in that because it is not beyond the capacity of the Nigerian government and people. It is a matter of developing the political will to address this issue. Now, um, you asked about the desertification and, of course, uh, population, whether they have any role to play. Of course, population has grown. It is not uh, what Nigeria was during the time of uh, independence that it is now. Uh, they are, we are now almost uh, 200 and something million. And I told you about uh, the land uh, area of Southeast comprising five states, which is 29,388 square kilometers. You can imagine such a small, uh, small land area, which is occupied by five states. And these states are populous. I told you the population of the in population of uh, those that are living inside, not those that are outside. So it is a factor in the conflict. But uh, of course, what is uh, mentioned that is very strategic also is the issue of uh, this secessionist movement. Okay? You really can distinguish between the battle now, between headers and farmers, and uh, the headers and this uh, secessionist movement, especially the Eastern Security Network. There is a mix of uh, this conflict now. The security forces are also deep into this conflict. Because why they are fighting the secessionist uh, movement, this is their Eastern Security Network, it is assumed that the federal government has delegated them to decimate this uh, secessionist movement. So they transfer the aggression also to these headers. And their concern is that the headers should leave every land of Southeast completely because they have broken ties arising from the, the memory of the war and the, how they are being treated politically. Now, on the issue of Buhari's government and the, the level of impact it has brought to bear on this head of family relationship and the conflict, uh, the fact is that uh, it is not that we have not had this conflict before. But we look at the magnitude now. When Buhari assumed office, every aspect of the conflict magnified in scope. You recall that when Jonathan was the president, Boko Haram was uh, rampaging and causing co crisis everywhere, killing people everywhere. It was first assumed that it was targeted at Christians. And when all the Christians ran away from the north as initial measure to safeguard their lives, then they found no Christians again. They started attacking Northerners. That was when people knew that Boko Haram was out for something else. Now, these headers, it is not that it is Christian-Muslim issue. These headers are also, as well attacking people in the North. They are destroying things in the North. But the kind of peculiar situation in the Southeast, arising from the war, the experience of the war, that any Northerner coming to dominate a phase of Southeast or to occupy the forest, the farmland, that intent must be investigated. And that is why they get worried, because they are no longer reporting to, of course, uh, pledge their loyalty. They are no longer reporting to accept the responsibility for any destruction of property. They are no longer, lo longer reporting for anything else. Nobody knows when they come in. They just settle anywhere, and they become a threat to all the environment. Of course, this crisis has caused a whole lot of uh, you know, issue in terms of uh, crop production. Farmers no longer go to farm, and you know the implication of that. Crops are no longer produced. There are no food stuff again. The little one that is available, people compete, with, uh, compete to get them. And of course, there is no money. So these are the issues. That is why Southeast is today just uh, you know, suffering hunger, and of course, nobody is coming to their rescue. So we must do something about this, and the government is not yet disposed. He talked about uh, the livestock transformation uh, 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 plan. That one very strategic, but it's still in the paper. It has ended with the opening ceremony. When the vice president commissioned it, it was just a fun fair. 
After that, most of the states are still complaining. Why is it that federal government is not coming up with uh, the actual implementation of this plan? Nigeria is fond of developing a blueprint in a paper, but the implementation has always been an issue. So, uh, of course, that is a challenge that will be thrown to government. They have to be realistic and take up responsibility for whatever shortcoming that is coming as a result of all this. Because if they are proactive, most of what is being experienced today will not be uh, found in any part of Nigeria or Southeast. Thank you. I'll, I'd like to take another round if there's further questions in the audience. Hmm? All right. And, and while Gamu is bringing you the mic, um, I'll just highlight two things that both of you, while, while answering different questions, highlighted, though. Um, the first was on um, the United States' potential role um, adding value in addressing the climate drivers. So Dr. Dirksen, you particularly mentioned data and supporting data to understand and fill some of the research gap. Um, that, is, that is necessary, and um, Dr. Okiba, you also mentioned their role in supporting on the climate um, element. And then another issue that you both raised, and, and actually I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll touch on it a bit more because some questions are coming online about this, um, but just the question of developing political will and the, the challenge of political will to address some of these challenges and um, manifesting itself with the need for more implementation for the, the National Livestock Plan. But with that, come on. The next question, please. Hi, um, thank you all so much. Uh, this is super interesting and informative. Um, my name is Holly. I'm working at USAID this summer in between years of uh, master's in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I served in the Peace Corps in, Cam in Northern Cameroon and um, saw some of these issues. I was in agriculture. so. Um, I, I guess my question, as we're speaking about um, kind of the, at least the solutions that are being developed by the government, if not implemented, um, the Fulani uh, are kind of a group that's across West Africa, um, in Northern Cameroon as well, and often as in Cameroon, Nigeria, et cetera, are like very marginalized um, and don't usually have like very much power in government, um, in local government, in any kind of land ownership. Um, so I'm wondering if in that strategic plan or um, if there are other solutions that you all can think of um, that allow like the Fulani people that are herders um, to really be, to have power in these processes, especially if the solution is to move to ranching, which is not anything that they've done in the past for the most part. Um, I've heard before that oftentimes this ends up being like people that are more uh, integrated into agriculture who do ranching as well and not the Fulani who are um, herding and so they're kind of further marginalized um, and like not incorporated in this process which wouldn't necessarily solve the problem if there's still going to be conflict with them moving forward um, and um, I guess uh, the end of that question is um, what ways are there to sort of incorporate them into this process um, and make sure that they have livelihoods moving forward, especially when um, they're often becoming radicalized in part because of this marginalization um, and that leading to um, like participation in some violent extremist organizations. Anyone else in the audience have a question? Monday does. Monday Mayunga with the Wilson Center's Africa program. Um, Dr. Okiba, you mentioned something, and perhaps uh, Dr. Dirksen could also speak to this. Uh, but you, you talked about how uh, this issue is an Africa-wide uh, problem. And you can leave this question to the end if people want to focus more on Nigeria. But it led me to thinking about, you said the AU ought to do something about it. I think two points. First, I have always felt that uh, the, the African Union's mechanism for addressing conflict 
is one, more focused on what you do about conflict once it has broken out and not on the preventative side of things. And so how do we shift that balance, which would uh, enable us to then deal with this issue on the preventative side? And secondly, that the African Union and the international community in terms of framework for addressing conflict and tensions, it's probably much stronger uh, when you look at politically driven and motivated conflict. What we are talking about here is um, what I see as a huge issue for the continent in, in years to come that is land and water um, driven uh, conflicts, which tie back to the question of uh, climate change as we were talking about. This is going to be a key conflict area uh, on, on the continent. And so my question to you is, as you look at these questions, are you aware of any good examples from Africa or elsewhere in terms of good land and water management uh, that could perhaps be applied uh, to a situation like this or that we could learn from? I will reverse the order. Dr. Okibi, I'll, I'll turn it over to you first and then um, down to Dr. Mark. Um, addressing the first question, looking at, at I think what, what Holly's um, talking about is a need for more inclusiveness and representation as well for um, these Fulani people in some of the governance structures and how to um, to improve upon that um, to address some of these challenges. And then also Mandy's question about what are some good examples um, in terms of land and, and resource management. So I'll turn over to you and then. Okay, let me first is uh, let me address the issue you raised. If you look at uh, the structure of uh, governance in Africa, you will identify that uh, there are peculiarities that each country is, you know, having. If you come to Nigeria, the experience of war, any country that has fought war, there is always a serious issue handling any internal problem that they have. Because they usually align it with that uh, war. And that is what is happening in Nigeria. And because we have a uh, close to 25 million population of, uh, of uh, Fulanese in Africa, out of which about uh, 13 million of them are just uh, nomadics and the rest of them, the question you ask yourself is that in 1979, African Union identified quite a large population of people as stateless uh, people. And when you classify somebody as state stateless, what it means is that it does not belong to any state. And the person will be fighting to identify a state of origin where he can uh, just uh, at least uh, lay claim of title. And that is why you see Flannies moving from left to right, migrating from one point to the other, they don't have any permanent settlement. It's only where they are tolerated, they settle there. Now, the problem is that in the current Africa, Fulanese are the highest echelon of leadership in many countries. And they also belong to this African Union. They are also part of the spokespersons in this African Union. The question is, how do you take a decision that will just uh, have effect on them? Because they have seen this nomadic culture as something that has come to be, which modernization cannot change. So it is an issue that Africa is going to face, how to tamper with that kind of uh, attitude in the modern world. Now, if you look at uh, uh, Guinea, Sudan area, they have developed a template that uh, worked to a reasonable uh, point. The Fulanese, the pastoralists and the, the farmers, they had an agreement. The agreement is that they swap their byproducts. There is uh, this, uh, the, the grasses, which the uh, farmers uh, have as leftover of uh, their distance. They are just given to the Fulanese to at least uh, feed their cattle. And all these uh, the defications of uh, the cattle they collect it as manure and they use. So, and they gain direct fences to separate their farm from the grazing roots. So that fences, 
does not uh, allow the cattle to come into the farm. But this is something you cannot do in Nigeria. You know, Nigeria is a place where you cannot do such. Because one, agricultural production, it controls an expanse of ran, land that is not anything anybody can erect any fence. That is the basic truth. And the problem again is that because of climate change, which is now being discussed, climate change, at times, human, human can develop a technology to arrest you know, climate change. If you look at how Israel just uh, developed its agricultural economy, the, the, the fertility of uh, uh, Israeli land is not all that tolerant to any of agricultural disease, but they transformed it. So if they want to convert the northern, uh, most of the northern you know, land into agricultural zone, they can use the irrigation system and this uh, organic fertilizer, and they start to domesticate this thing so that eventually the whole land will become fertilized and, of course, start to grow grass. And rather than moving from left to right, they have concentration in one place. So Africa is still going to have a challenge overcoming this, and uh, I do not know to what extent the international community can just intervene, at least to be a, 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 a river between. It is purely an affair of Africa, and of course, uh, they have to take it, uh, you know, headlong. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the question about the um, Fulani and your perspective from Northern Cameroon, which I think is really um, illustrative of uh, an angle of, of this that we haven't really touched on enough, and that is, yeah, as you're mentioning, the, the marginalization um, and kind of, of, of Fulani's across West Africa um, and some of the issues that's leading to. And there is this tendency um, in a lot of communities in West Africa to um, conflate um, Fulani herders with, um, with militant extremists, with um, bandits, um, and there's you know, suspicion around them. Um, and this is actually being, this, um, this kind of perspective is being weaponized by militant Islamist groups in um, in northern Nigeria, um, in the Sahel, um, who are recruiting from these nomadic populations who do feel um, marginalized, dispossessed of their, their grazing lands. Um, you know, this, is, um, this pressure is being felt. Um, we recently at the Africa Center did some research on um, northern Benin, and it's the same dynamics there um, where um, herders and local communities that have um, coexisted and worked their problems out through these um, uh, peacekeeping mechanisms. That's under strain there. Um, and the Fulani um, herders there are um, openly being recruited by extremists from Burkina Faso to the north. Um, and so, you know, part of this is that being nomadic, being um, pastoralist, um, Fulani are often not in. Um, local government areas when decisions are made. And they'll come back the next season and, and um, things have been changed. Um, there's a new law in place. There's a ban on open grazing. Um, so that's, that's a challenge to um, these kind of um, uh, policies, these, um, this livestock transformation policy or, or plan um, is how are they included in, in these processes. And that's been a big flaw of it so far is that um, a lot of the herders, their perception is that these ranches are being, when they are actually set up, they're being given to local agriculturalists who are looking to expand into um, cattle rearing. Um, so that's, that's really going to be the, one of the crux of the issues um, is anytime the Nigerian government is involved in um, the generation, the production and distribution of a resource, a valuable resource, um, there's a lot of um, jockeying, a lot of suspicion about who is going to be the beneficiaries of that resource. You know, whether it's oil, um, whether it's it's other natural resources, um, who who is going to benefit from from the production of that um, that asset? And that's kind of where this plan is stalled in a lot of ways. Is who's gonna who is going to be um, granted these ranches, and where are they going to be set up? Um, and that's, that's a political question that is really thorny for Nigeria. Um, but I, I was here um, a couple of years ago with former Nigerian President um, Abbas Joe, 
Um, you know, he was the, the conversation was about managing Nigeria's ethnic diversity. And he spoke really eloquently about not seeing kind of Nigeria as this um, being torn apart by these different, um, you know, great diversity of languages and religions and ethnicities, but really seeing that as um, a strength for the country and something that Nigeria, um, through a change of outset, can really look on drawing on that as kind of this, this strong patchwork of different perspectives, different skills, um, different livelihoods to build a stronger country, a stronger um, economy. Um, so I think it's going to take that kind of visionary leadership, that kind of um, change in rhetoric in order to kind of work through these problems. And it, it is a political question, um, this question of how are these resources going to be distributed, and it needs to be worked out through a democratic um, process, um, which is going to be um, oftentimes slow and messy, but um, you know, that's, that's the only way to um, avoid these from escalating into to larger conflicts. And then on... Um, the, the question of, um, kind of regional bodies um, intervening or monitoring um, farmer herder conflict um, Africa-wide. I think when it comes to West Africa and, and Nigeria, I think probably um, ECOWAS is best positioned to um, be involved um, in you know, tracking some of these um, cross-border migration patterns and understanding um, who those herders are, where they're coming from, where they're looking for pasture. Um, and um, Niger ECOWAS has set up um, an early warning system um, that is pretty sophisticated, has a number of inputs, um, you know, looking at climate, looking at um, um, conflict, looking at um, economic indicators for where some of these concentrations of violence and being able to be not just responsive but predictive of when something is escalating. Um, and so that, that, that gives states a chance to intervene to send in security forces, provide that um, presence to deter and defuse the situation. Um, so hopefully that will continue to develop and really become a, a robust mechanism for um, monitoring um, farmer herder conflict in, in West Africa. I have a, about six minutes left in the event, and I want to get to a couple questions online. So I'm going to pose a couple questions to you both and just ask you to answer in a minute or less their, their online questions before I bring it back in and give you uh, both a chance for a final word. Um, so from online, uh, since you raise echo also, I want to address this first to you, Dr. Dirksen. How can the, uh, and I'll, I'll give a couple of questions, but the first one is how, how can the ECOWAS protocol on transhumans and free movement of persons be used to address some of these regional issues. And then a second question is on the role of youth. So could you talk about the potential role of youth in peace building processes in Nigeria? And, uh, and related to that, the um, potential for the National Youth Service Scheme to be utilized to support peace building and rebuilding trust and community relations. And then the third question is uh, back to the US government and how can the United States government assist in strategically supporting the Nigerian community, specifically though focus on um, restoring food security in Nigeria and surrounding nations? So those three questions, I will, um, again, I'll start with you, Dr. Okibe, then you, Dr. Dirksen. So in, in a minute or less for, for each one. So we've got about five minutes, so that math doesn't quite add up. But briefly, respond to those three questions, and then we'll bring it back in. OK, let me just uh, uh, say something on the uh, issue of um, ECOWAS. Of course, uh, the problem we have is that uh, Nigerian border, Nigerian border post is more than uh, 2,000 and something. And uh, the immigration and the custom officers have not been able to manage it effectively to prevent uh, uh, illegal immigrants from uh, coming into Nigeria. Uh, we have had several experiences where um, there are accusations against the government that um, the borders are thrown open for um, some um, elements to come in, especially those of uh, the full and the elements to come in. These are just a political accusation. 
If you come to Nigeria, you see uh, this accusation and counter accusation here and there that uh, the officers that are at the border are not doing enough to man these borders. But again, you ask yourself what equipment do they have to man the borders and what is the, the personnel capacity they have to man these borders. Most of them are located in most of the remote uh, communities that uh, one cannot know. So it, the, the, the porosity of the border is a big problem. So any time Nigeria can handle that one, I think it will go a long uh, way in uh, arresting some of these issues. But the problem is that uh, when these uh, uh, foreigners are also settled in Nigeria, I, I remember that uh, a senior government official has said that uh, foreigners do not have any, any country, they do not have any boundary anywhere. They can go and fraternize with their brothers wherever they feel, and that is the reason they have uh, free access, you know, migrating from one country to the other, and Nigeria, of course, uh, being the greatest beneficiary of such migration with all the troubles associated with it. Mm. So uh, that uh, protocol can be reviewed. Of course, that protocol is very strategic and it has some strength attached to it because it does not allow somebody who does not have valid uh, ECOWAS passport to move to any country that is a, a member of ECOWAS. But most of these people do not have a valid ECOWAS passport. And that is why even in my recommendation, I say that Government should identify and deport all those that do not have legal documents to live in Nigeria. Because that is a qualifying uh, you know, criteria for somebody to migrate to Nigeria. So ECOWAS can review that and see to what extent it is uh, strong to restrict the uh, careless movement of people across the border. If it is not, they can introduce a, a more strict uh, measure to ensure that uh, anybody who is moving from one country to the other uh, produces a requisite uh, document that will adjust the permit is uh, admission in that country. Now, you, you talked about the role of youth in uh, conflict uh, mitigation or prevention and the whatever. The, the, the problem is that there are classes of conflicts and you treat each conflict according to its own uh, dynamics. If it is an ordinary conflict, it is easier for youth to handle. But this very conflict has become a serious issue. We are even the youth are instruments for prosecution of the conflict. The, the Igbo youth under the umbrella of uh, Eastern Security Network, you know, even surpassing that, are waging war, a sort of war, against uh, the full and invasion of the, the zone so there is nothing. Government has done everything humanly possible to ensure that the arrest, the involvement of the youth in this matter, but it has not even given any uh, positive result. I, I recall that the uh, government of uh, the states in the southeast formed uh, some security uh, networks. We have a forest guard, which they formed at the beginning of this uh, uh, crisis. Along the line, they formed the, the one could name the Ebubago. Ebubago was purely to enforce the ban on uh, open grazing. And, uh, and you can see the kind of conflict. What it means is that more youth are being recruited into the struggle. Mm -hmm. Because anyone you form, you empower them to fight the war. That is not a peace building mechanism. Because what it means is that as these people are migrating, you as well forming more groups to match their number that are coming, and that does not give any sense of uh, you know, uh, peace, because what it does is to escalate conflict. So uh, it is very proper that uh, government to some lines that we give uh, some level of uh, understanding to all the parties that are involved. That is why education is very, very uh, key in this uh, matter. When the Fulanese are educated on what is their expectation in each place, I think with that firm understanding, they will learn to behave accordingly. But because of the infiltration of these uh, militants into the fold of these uh, Fulanese, I, I, I do not think that uh, it is even a, a process of maybe talking about uh, uh, the youth now being agent of this thing. Youth have been very strategic in uh, maintaining peace in most of the communities, but not in the context of where People's uh, means of livelihood are being uh, destroyed. 
and many of them are being rendered useless. So it gives the youth the, you know, the urge to go and uh, do a defense. Okay. Dr. Dirksen, I hope maybe you're a bit more optimistic on the role <laughs> of youth. I, I think so. Um, and I think this is what I, I would want to say just for my uh, final wrap-up comment anyway. Um, it's just youth, and um, that is really a key part of what we're talking about. Um, and it's, it's what's driving this population increase that I was talking about. It's um, this coming youth bulge of, um, you know, people are very young in Nigeria. The median age is around 18. Um, so these are tens of millions of young people who are looking for livelihood, who are looking for food security, who are looking for um, shelter, who are looking for, um, uh, you know, a, a place to call home in a nation to um, call their own. Um, and there's a real, I think, hunger for reform amongst Nigerian youth. Um, we saw that with the NSARS protest, um, that was a movement looking for um, Nigerian police reform um, and disbandment of this one particular branch of the Nigerian security sector that had really become rogue and was abusing people, especially in urban areas. And these protests were seen across the country, young people turned out. Um, unfortunately, they were violently suppressed, and the reforms that come out of them haven't quite materialized yet. Um, but there is this this drive and this demand that um, things change. And I think um, there there are a lot of initiatives we could point to. There have been really successful common ground kind of programs in the Middle Belt states led by youth leaders um, working with um, uh, farmer herders communities, working with other places like Jos, where there's been intercommunal conflict, and they've had real successes in those places. Um, and so I think that the, the younger generation in the Southeast, my um, perception is they don't necessarily see um, these trends and these conflicts through the same lenses as the previous generation. They might not necessarily see it through the lens of the Nigerian Civil War. For them, that's, that's ancient history. Um, you know, this is um, more about... Um, you know, they're looking for um, really something to, to grab on to and to um, find a, a Nigerian government that is responsive to them. And when it's not there, then, you know, they may be um, convinced by some of these separatist groups or some of these um, organized criminal groups and recruited by them. Um, but I think that if, if, you know, West Africa, Nigeria is going to face this continued, this population pressure, um, it's, it's talked about a lot of times in terms of, you know, this uh, youth bulge or this, you know, explosion, and it's just going to be this unmanageable population increase. Um, but I think it, there's also just a lot of um, potential there, a lot of hope. There's just this new generation of young people who are looking for reform, looking for democratic processes to work for them. Um, and so it's just a matter of... Um, leveraging that energy um, and those new ideas, those fresh ways of thinking. Um, Nigeria has a chance to do that now with this upcoming election next year. Um, so we'll see if there are um, you know, politicians who um, propose policies, who propose new um, visions for the country that um, the youth are receptive to, because it is going to take really a, a new way of thinking as these um, old systems come under stress and as these frictions come up um, really broad and visionary thinking is needed, and I think that's what um, youth are looking for. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, I, I know that we didn't actually get to all the questions submitted online, so rest assured I will also share those with our speakers so they can see some of the, the questions as well. Um, but just join me, please, in thanking um, our speakers today. Dr. Okibe, as well as um, his fellow Southern Voices Network for Peace Building scholar, Dr. Florence Odiwar, will be publishing uh, their respective research papers and policy briefs in the coming weeks. So definitely encourage you to um, access those papers. You'll be able to find them at wilsoncenter.org. And um, look at that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. And have a great rest of your day. <laughs>